everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Now, today, I'm really excited to welcome back Dan Peterson and Dr. Len Zykowski onto the show. Welcome back, guys. Great to have you back on. Thanks for inviting us, Dan. It's a pleasure. Dan, it's a pleasure. Great to be back. Uh, it's been a couple years since we talked, but so happy to be back on your show. It was episode 23, January 2019. I looked it up earlier, so it has been a couple of years. And look, it's so cool to have you back on. And it's an exciting time as well, because in those couple of years, you have both been really busy writing a follow-up to your first book, The Playmaker's Advantage. And that was all about superior athlete cognition. You've got a new book out. What is this book called? Yeah, and what's what's interesting, Dan, is um, when that book came out two years ago, uh, we put it out there. You know, Len and I have been working together over the years, and we both had similar interests. Obviously, Len has had a very long and distinguished career in uh, academia as a sports performance psychologist at Boston University, and I just had a general interest as a writer and as a sports dad to look at some of these cognitive issues of what we call our young playmakers. Uh, we, we both have sons who grew up in sports. We enjoyed watching them, but I was always fascinated with how they make all of those uh, decisions that involved not only perception, but also the skills that they're learning. And so there was a lot of emphasis on physical training, but I was always interested in the brain. Obviously, Len has, he devoted his career to it. And we put that first book together as just kind of a general overview for our own interests, but also for parents and coaches about uh, how young athletes, developing athletes use their brains. And so that book came out a couple of years ago, as you said, and we got very good feedback. The book's done well. And, but the biggest question we got back from athletes, parents, coaches is, in the middle of our, what we call our athlete cognition cycle, which is pretty much see, decide, act, a lot of variations of that that you've seen out there. Everyone came back and said, could you drill down a little more into that decision-making black box? Because, you know, we can train the attention, we can train the perception, uh, vision of the field, we can train skills on the back end, technique, et cetera, the technical part of the game. But it's that decision-making that drives coaches crazy, probably parents in the stands as well. Uh, as far as good decisions, bad decisions, and as the subtitle of this new book is, you know, clutch plays versus mental mistakes. And you watch any sport these days and the commentators, et cetera, are talking about the difference between those two, uh, making great decisions, uh, when to pass, when to shoot, et cetera. But then also those mental lapses where it's kind of uh, stupefying how someone made that decision when they know better, when they you know, have had all this training, et cetera. So uh, Len and I sat down and said, well, okay, if we're going to do a follow-up, let's drill down into decision-making. And that's why we call this book The Playmaker's Decisions. Well, as you mentioned there, Dan, that, that, that first book was about athlete cognition search decide execute see think do and this book is well what you describe in the book the the mushy middle bit that's your your description which i which i love and i and i think just before we dive in just turning to to yourself len i mean for me as a uh, a sports psychologist and I mean, having been a sports psych for 15 years now. So I, I have a reasonable amount of experience. I mean, you're one of the, the big players in our industry. You have a, a, a legendary status, if you like, and it's such an honor and pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, I suppose, Len, for 40, 50 years that you've been a, a practitioner, a sports psychologist, you must have had so many conversations around this decision area with coaches from a number of sports. Um, and so writing this book, writing the last book, must be quite cathartic for you. Well, thanks uh, for the kind words, Dan. 
What's interesting is that uh, in my early days of being a sports psychologist, an academic one, and one who was able to consult a lot across many sports around the world and different sports, uh, the, the whole notion of decision making was not in, in our toolkit for sports psychologists. Mm, okay. And it's only only recently, Dan, where I know we tried to push it in the book, and I would say it may have been just kind of in the last half dozen years, and I really, after all those years of, of, of developing these so-called mental skills mm. for performers, that I realized that we're missing something really important, and that's decision making. Why is that the case? Is it because we can't measure the stuff? You know, and you have to remember too that was before a lot of the practical neuroscience information came out, mm. and the importance of the brain. Uh, so uh, yes, I was. I've been in the field a long time, Dan, but it's it's. Uh, uh, I'd say in the last uh, decade or so, where I've really been pushing uh, for the importance of uh, decision making uh, that, you know, aspiring young sports psychologists should learn as much as they can about, because I think it, it may very well be the single most important thing in helping athletes and coaches, the whole thinking about how, how are decisions made. So that's kind of what got me into it. And uh, I'm going to keep pushing my career at this point to uh, try to uh, educate uh, uh, the, you know, people who are, who are interested in helping performers get as, as much expertise as they can in this area uh, because I think it's that vital. Well, we're certainly very grateful for that. And um, just to say to the Sports Psych Show audience, I mean, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we spoke on episode 23. And I think this episode um, fits very, very neatly with the past couple of weeks on the Sports Psych Show. I spoke to Lisa Feldman Barris, uh, one of the world's leading neuroscientists, and a reading uh, through uh, your book, The Playmaker's Advantage, really aligns really nicely with with her book about the brain last week I spoke with doug lamov um a leading educationalist in america again aligns lovely with your book and and just going back to episode 78 um i spoke with dr scott goldman about his athletic intelligent uh, yes. inventory and i know len actually i've i've read a paper that you co-wrote with him so i i, I know you know scott so uh, and, and we can yeah. perhaps allude to some of his stuff um uh, as, as we go yeah, through. It all ties together. It all ties together. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It all ties together. So coming back to the Playmaker's Advantage, I, I've loved going through this book. Um, it's it's in three parts, and we're really going to focus over the next 50, 55 minutes on the, the first two parts, um, especially. The overarching notion is your athlete decision model, your ADM, athlete decision model, which uh, you, you sheepishly announce at the beginning of the book, because I, I think you both feel it hasn't got a grandiose enough name but um, I think it's nice and simple and I think it, it, it's going to be a really important model for coaches to pay attention to um, but I, I'm really excited to go through this Dan when you sat down uh, and, and, and started this book three parts did you have that clear in your mind that, that this was going to be the structure of the book <laughs> um, only that uh, you know kind of this book, The Playmaker's Decisions, uh, mirrored the first book, The Playmaker's Advantage. And uh, if nothing else, we own the word playmaker on Amazon, I think. So <laughs> if anyone searches for that, they'll hopefully come up with our books. Um, I think the um, just the, the structure of the book, um, you know, Len and I talked a lot about, okay, this, this whole topic of decision making mm. for the playmaker. And even when we go back to the first book in our you know, our, our use of the word playmaker, you know, we really kind of said, well, you know, we want this book to be accessible to parents and coaches. We don't want it to be a textbook. Uh, we want it to be stories, interesting stories, hopefully, uh, combined with science so that people can get through it and give them, a, a you know, some stories and some science stories and some science. And so like with Playmaker's Advantage and the athlete cognition model, we thought, okay, well, what would be a similar type of memory device, if you will, a framework, 
uh, to describe decision making. And we spent some time on that and we looked at the research, we looked at everything that's out there. And, you know, our our nomenclature is is no better or worse than the others that are out there. There's a lot of different models out there and we talk about them in the book. But we thought, well, let's let's just summarize it as, as we thought. Um, and so the two parts are really talking about Uh, First of all, we took the athlete decision model and we said, what really affects a player's decisions out on the field? And the playmaker term is really meant to distinguish those who do it well Um, across all sports. You know, the word playmaker is used to identify that player who seems to have a better vision of the field and makes better decisions. And so with developing athletes who want to aspire to that, uh, then that's what we tried to describe is for that playmaker, that point guard, that midfielder, that quarterback, who's making all of the right decisions, they want to be more like them. So that's why we call it that. But we really kind of divided it in the decision-making process into two sections, traits and constraints. Traits being those uh inner qualities, those inner uh, skills, some of them inherited uh, that you're born with, some can be developed, but those are the things that are going to affect you. It describes you as a, as a player. Uh, constraints are things that the game puts on you. So things like time and rules uh, and tactics, those are th- outside influences, outside constraints that will affect your decision-making, how you decide to do something on the field. So And then the third part, obviously, is um, something everyone wants to know. Uh, How do we improve uh, developing athlete decision-making? But then we threw in a chapter right before that about, well, before you can improve it, you probably should learn how to measure the decision-making. And that's that's still a, a topic of its own, of how exactly within this world of analytics, how exactly we can measure decisions. So, Len, what do you have to add to that? Well, it's a, that's a, a good answer, Dan, as to how we broke it into, and we broke the book into three parts. They were kind of logical, and they can be kind of read kind of independently, but there's a logical sequence to it. Uh, one thing I'd like to add is that, you know, what's interesting in the, in the Playmaker's Advantage, we we, we uh, pulled up uh, Cowie Leonard, who... Uh, Hardly anybody, well, we knew he was a great basketball player, but it was before he really got to shine uh, for Toronto, for the Toronto Raptors in that uh, incredible championship game and, and games leading up to it. And uh, little did we know that he was as good as he really was. But we, we spent a lot of time talking about him. And in this book, we also try to feature great playmakers uh, as we define them, people who individuals who, who just go through those the whole process of decision making to kind of read the plays to make quick and accurate decisions and and not mess up uh, they execute well so we we spent in one of our chapters writing a lot about uh, uh, a former NBA player uh, who uh, I was hoping we could we could interview for uh, for the first book, it just never happened. Steve Nash, uh, uh, who had a brilliant NBA career, and a lot of people, but he, now he's the the head coach of the Brooklyn franchise. And uh, I just could never get a hold of him for an interview. But uh, this year, I did some past year, I did a bit of consulting with the Golden State Warriors, and Steve was a consultant to them, and we happened to meet there, get there on the same day, per chance, had a wonderful time with him, and. Uh, we were hoping that we could get an, an extra interview, but by then he'd signed on as a coach and was already buried in, in work, so we never got to him, much like we, I told you on pre, pre-show with Eddie Jones. But it was to kind of highlight these, these wonderful examples of, of playmakers who could, who could read the plays well in advance, could anticipate it. We call it a lot of that's anticipation. Uh, make that right decision. Um, which is not easy to do, uh, and then execute. And getting back to that decision, Dan, uh, I think it's important to mention, too, that when we talk about the, kind of the factors that kind of mess up that decision-making, and that's that whole ability to control emotions. And these great playmakers, they do that. They, It's performing under pressure when those emotions kind of get out of control. They can, they can handle that. 
the, the subpar players, the non-playmakers, just don't have that capacity. So that's the most intriguing part of all of this. And I guess as Dan was pointing out, uh, uh, the big question that the coaches all have is uh, now how do we train the stuff? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it, it, and it is such an accessible book, and the stories in there, whether they're the scientific stories or the actual sporting stories, really bring to life uh, this idea of uh, decision making. Let's dive in. Um, part one: traits, as you've mentioned, Dan, and those traits uh, specifically being attention, cognition, and emotion. And, you know, Len, you've, you've talked about playmakers and really trying to bring this to life uh, through story, through examples, real world examples. And you start with attention and you start really with this, um, with the story of Greg Maddox, the uh, baseball uh, pitcher. And essentially you uh, inform the audience that Maddox is magic, at least in part, comes from thinking about pitching at such depths that go beyond what hitters might reasonably expect. Um, it seems like he spends a lot of time thinking about pitching, and so subsequently that drives his attention. Talk to me a little bit about Greg Maddox, um, the start of his chapter on attention. Yeah, it was... Um... When we talk about, you know, at first we thought about, well, maybe that first uh, that first trait should be perception. Uh, that's talked a lot about a lot, mm. awareness, etc. And then we kind of focused more on the attention word. Okay. And there was just such a goldmine of material out there as far as uh, paying attention to the right things during a game. Mm. And some of it is you know, in game, you think about a fast moving game, uh, soccer, hockey, basketball, and there's so many little things to be uh, aware of, pay attention to, things not to pay attention to. Uh, and we go through some of those things later in the chapter. But this opening story we thought was interesting because uh, for those of those who know American baseball, Greg Maddox has been retired for a number of years, but he's in the Hall of Fame and he was part of a an amazing Atlanta Braves pitching staff where their top three pitchers um, are all in the Hall of Fame now. And But Maddox was really the leader of that group. And anyone you talk to, the stories you read about him, it was never about overpowering fastballs or, you know, it was all with Maddox. It was all about intellect and it was all about obsessive studying of his oppo opposing hitters. And he would know so many things about opposing hitters and their habits and their tendencies. And he would use that against them and he would pay attention to all of those little things. So we, there was a great story we found about uh, in, back in 1996. Um, he had a, a relatively new catcher for him, a gentleman named Eddie Perez. And so Eddie was just coming up. Um, uh, one of Maddox's previous uh, catchers had, had left the team. So Eddie was starting to learn the role. And we, we talk about how others in the Braves organization told Eddie, you know what? Greg's a genius. So if he tells you to do something, just do it. You know, don't don't argue with it. And uh, and so they he tells a story about they were uh, uh, playing a game. It was late in the season in 1996. Uh, they were fa facing the Houston Astros and another All Star hitter, Jeff Bagwell, known for his power, known for his home runs. And they basically. Uh, the game was at hand. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll just read directly from the book here. In their third season together, the balance of knowledge was evening out with Perez feeling more like an equal partner. He recalled one game in mid-August against the Houston Astros. The Braves were comfortably ahead 4-0 late in the game. Maddox had already had always instructed Perez that they would never pitch inside to Astro slugger Jeff Bagwell to avoid his sweet spot. But in this game, with Bagwell at the plate, Maddox went off script and threw an inside fastball, which Bagwell launched over 500 feet foul. Undeterred and to Perez's surprise, Maddox again offered a tempting pitch right in Bagwell's inside wheelhouse, 
which the All-Star seized on, sending it into the left field bleachers. The Braves prevailed, but Perez felt cheated and said so to his pitcher. I was mad, he said. After the game, I was like, why? We could have struck him out like we always do. But uh, he, Maddox, was like, they have a good team and they might be in the playoffs a few months from now. But Perez was still mad. and He said, whatever, dude, I want that complete game and I'm not worried about three months from now. Sure enough, later that fall, a few weeks later, during game one of the National League Division Series between the Braves and the Astros, Maddox threw a perfect first inning, striking out Bagwell with a selection of pitches all away and on the outside corners. And that's when Perez remembered what Maddox told him. And this is Perez. When we were walking back to the dugout, he said, do you remember two months ago? I, Perez said, I already forgot about it. But he said, Bagwell was looking for that inside pitch the whole time. Then he turned around and laughed. That's something I'm never going to forget. So, and there's other stories of Maddox doing this where he will set up a guy and there's stories of him setting up a guy and then a year or two later, striking him out with something. So he gave up the moment uh, just to set something up down the line where it really mattered. And that's something that, you know, as far as paying attention to the details, uh, that, that others, other playmakers may not. If I, if I could add to that too, it, 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 Dan, it kind of, it, it's for sure it's attention, attention to detail, but it also brings in the other cognitive dimensions of the importance of human memory. Like, well, well the, great, the great playmakers have fantastic memory in all sports, but there is a, here's the characteristic that's so important that they have this memory to remember those events and what to do. So that it, it's, it's, not a simple model. It's pretty complex. Uh, I agree, Len. And um, it, it, it just, to me, demonstrates the importance of attention and memory in terms of expertise. Yes. Um, experts anticipate or predict um, as a consequence of all of the information they've accrued uh, over years. And there's an interesting piece of research in this part of the book from Dan Bishop, Dr. Dan Bishop at Brunel University, who uh, talks about uh, mirror neurons. Dan, what does he say? What does Dan Bishop say? I was just trying to get the exact line here. Um, yeah, along with um, uh, Dr. Abernathy, another giant in the industry. Um, yeah. So they did an experiment where they asked uh, 39 participants divided into three levels of soccer skill, uh, and they actually had them lie in an fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner, while viewing mm -hmm. video clips of oncoming attackers, which I thought was interesting. Um, and what they tried to do with that is to watch the brain activity of those volunteers while they made that decision. So in other words, what exactly is going on in their brain when they make those decisions? Um, they predicted that the expert soccer players who were in the experiment use a mirror neuron system to guess the intentions of the attacker. And they were right. Uh, just as they hypothesized, there were significant differences in prediction skill between the top performers and the intermediate group and uh, from the intermediate group down to the, to the beginners. Um, there was little mirror neur neuron difference between the lower two groups. There was an intermediate group and a beginner group. But mm. But among the, um, uh, the playmakers, if we will, in, in our nomenclature and the rest yep. of the group, there was a significant uh, activity in those mere neuron regions. Um, in fact, I have a quote here. The brain activation differences witnessed may correspond to not only the surpassing of a threshold for hours accumulated in practice to become expert, but also the quality of such practice. So, and then he goes on to say, our neuro neuroimaging data clearly shows greater activation of motor and related structures in the brains of expert footballers compared to novices when taking part in a football-related anticipation uh, task. And we believe this greater level of neural activity is something that can be developed through high-quality training. So the next step, you know, is how to look at um, what type of training uh goes into that. So yeah, it, it was really putting a stamp on, this isn't just um, uh, anecdotal that we actually put these guys in a, in a brain scanner and we found that the playmakers, the expert players, their brains actually function differently. If I could add to that too, Dan, you know, what often drives me crazy and I suspect it, it does for you also when, uh, 
an explanation for that, usually by sports writers, would be, uh, well, that athlete just showed in, incredible instincts <laughs> or it's reflexive action. And uh, I, I was taught years ago in, in a comparative psychology class that humans don't possess instincts. You know, they're uh, with animals. So, you know, where did where do they make those correct anticipations? Well, it's spending hours and hours at seeing very similar kinds of plays and knowing what's going to come next. And so it's it's not an instinct. And uh, it drives me crazy when I hear that word. And you, you'll hear every night on, on television broadcasts of any sport, uh, the athletes having great instincts. But, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to change that vocabulary. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you've encountered that much yourself. No, I have. I have. And, and I agree. And it, it frustrates me. Uh, so, so what we're saying in this chapter um, is that experts pay attention to the right things. Focus is different to paying attention. That we can, we might be focused, but we might be paying attention to the wrong things. When uh, the best players, the playmakers, using your term, are, are the ones that every single day, possibly every single second or multiple times during training, they're paying attention to the right things. They're building up a catalog, a library of, of knowledge. And then subsequently, when they go back onto the pitch, the court, the course, the field, um, they're, they're utilizing this knowledge, this memory bank. They're, they're, ut- they're, they're directing their attention appropriately. And and what's interesting is that you have a little story from Martina Navratilova, or at least a, a quote. This attention might not just be visual, it could be auditory. And Navratilova says, um, so much of our capacity to play tennis at the highest level is dependent on hearing the ball being hit. H- really interestingly, hearing reaction times is 140 to 160 milliseconds versus visual stimuli uh, processing, which is 180 to 200 milliseconds. So auditory um, stimuli uh, makes a big difference to a tennis player. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 in the, uh, the story we tell about Martina Navratilova and, and other tennis players as well, is that's why she was so annoyed when people, uh, her opposing players, uh, started the habit of grunting uh, whenever they would serve or when they would return a volley, uh, because they she basically came out and said that's cheating uh, that. They don't necessarily have to grunt. That's that was the defense of some of these other players. It's just something natural. I do. I grunt when I hit the ball. But she's like, no, it's a little more than that. That they're trying to actually cover up the sound of the ball hitting the racket, and that puts me at a disadvantage if I can't hear the ball coming off the racket. And I pick up a lot of things from the sound of that. Uh, if I miss out on that sound, I, I I I'm at a disadvantage there. So. Um, not only is it visual, which is most of it, some say 70 to 75% of attention, but but also the plenty of audio. And then we talk about, you know, my favorite quarterback, <laughs> Green Bay Packers uh, quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, and his, um, among other things, his uh, uh, skill at drawing off, uh, defensive linemen off sides by using changes in his cadence when he's up at the line and he will uh, fool them with different auditory uh, uh, utterances and get them to jump off sides uh, and has made kind of an art out of it. So yeah, the auditory part is very, very important. Um, I think it's really interesting with the auditory part that that part of the book reminded me of a film I saw. I don't know if you've guys seen this. It's a Clint Eastwood film called Trouble with the Curve, yeah. uh, where he he plays a, a baseball uh, scout, and it's very much the old new school versus old school version of yes, we want technology, yes, we want data, but you know. Um, experience counts and he listened to the noise of uh, the ball coming off the bat and could tell what was going to happen and whether this player you know the weaknesses the player is going to possess as a consequence of what he's heard and that really resonated with me guys because having been a pro golfer having coached for thousands of hours golf before I before I became a sports psychologist you can hear as a golfer you can hear the impact 
uh, of the ball, whether it was the, the swing was timed, the hands and arms with the body. It, that expertise is can be somewhat underrated now, I think, with the emergence of technology and probably with the emergence of more ecological approaches to coaching. No question there, just my thought for the day, I suppose. Yeah, you no, know, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, and, and as a player, I'm sure you, you, you notice that too. I certainly do. You, you hear that sound when you hit that sweet spot, for sure. Yeah. 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 There's no denying it, and you can see the results as well. And just as the, uh, you know, the job of the playmaker is to use that attention and to learn what to pay attention to, uh, the job of the mm-hmm. opponent is to disrupt that attention and get them, just like uh, the grunting in tennis or, or other things, to throw them off the trail and get them to pay attention to things that they shouldn't be paying attention to. And we talk a little bit about that in, in that chapter about, we went down the road of of magic and magicians, and especially sleight of hand magicians who make an art, and in fact now a science, out of uh, distracting attention, drawing your attention away from what they don't want you to see when they slip something in their pocket or behind your ear or something, uh, and how they've made that uh, certainly as an art, but now some scientific studies that have been done with these magicians, Penn and Teller, Apollo Robbins, the the celebrity pickpocket, uh, and they show how uh, their subjects are fooled and what exactly is happening in their brains when their attention is drawn away from from something else. And it goes to the same as um, uh, back to sports, you know, some of the moves, the the step over. I mean, and Dan, you know this, the the whole point of that is to draw your attention away and, and uh, get you taking one wrong step the wrong way so that they can go by you. And the same with the crossover dribble in basketball. It's designed to fool you so that you're paying attention to the wrong thing and then moving forward. Uh, and there's also another component to it is <laughs> that is very common. We, we it, It's part of the game now. It's the whole notion of, of trash talk. Uh, and uh, what's the purpose of trash talk? Oftentimes it's just it's to distract mm-hmm. the, your, your opponent and pay attention to the wrong stuff. So, uh, yeah, so there's, a, there's the physical distractors and there's also the the cognitive <laughs> distractions. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, Len. And, and and as you were both speaking there, I was thinking about, you know, if we're talking about playmaker expertise, uh, I think uh, most people's uh, sporting fans' brains would go straight to uh, Brazilian soccer players. And I once heard a, a, a speaker talk about um, their, their flair, their skill, potentially comes from... Uh, Capoeira, the street dance stroke martial art, they tend to learn, uh, generic broad brush statement, but we'll go with it, tend, tend to sure. learn prior to actually playing soccer or are, are engaged in Capoeira as they're playing soccer and learning soccer. And, you know, you talk about deception there, Capoeira, the capacity to throw a shape um uh, with the ball at your feet is the ultimate deception uh, uh maker isn't it and it, it throws somebody the opponent in a 1v1 off uh, a skew offline and uh, you can go around your opponent quite easily so that seems to go nicely hand in hand there so attention and deception um start off part 1 and then we move on to cognition um Talk to me about the cognition of LeBron James and Aaron Rodgers. What, what's so special about their cognition? Yeah, and so uh, again, in our, our section on traits, and so we thought about, mm. in addition to how well you pay attention to things, obviously decisions come from the brain. And so there are some uh, natural born and some learned cognitive skills that uh, the top playmakers use, uh, some things like uh, information processing speed, working memory capacity, uh, executive function skills. These are core cognitive skills that everyone has to varying degrees. And some uh, may show uh, greater uh, levels of skill or greater levels of capacity. And we talk a little bit about in the book about um, 
some of the players who have amazing memories. And these are memories of obviously in their sport, uh, but also some just, they, they show some uncanny <laughs> memories for other things. So we talk a little bit about, you know, LeBron James, of course, one of the best basketball players in history. And his teammates will joke about the memory he has, not only of, of basketball plays, et cetera, that he's played in the past in games from five, 10 years ago, but the amazing recall he has of other things. Uh, there was a story we put in there about Chris Bosch told a story about they were sitting around the players lounge one day and they were watching a uh, college football game. And uh, LeBron walked in and said, oh, that's so-and-so. He was drafted number 43 uh, a few years ago. And they all looked at him like, how do you know this stuff? And he goes, I don't know. I just I just do. And you know, Aaron Rodgers, I've listened to him on podcasts where someone will ask him a question about last week's game. And he'll not only be able to tell you every single detail about every play, but he'll go back in time and we, there was a, I think it was a Sports Illustrated story about how he can remember his high school football games. And, you know, he's 36 years old now. He can remember his high school football games and someone will give him a cue of, okay, there was a game where you threw six touchdowns and in high school. And he recalled, he's thought for maybe 10 seconds and said, oh yeah. And then he listed off the individual play of each of the touchdowns, what was called, who he threw the ball to, the name of the person he threw the ball to, the team they were playing. It it was just, it it was kind of (laughs) spooky how his memory works. And so not to say that you have to have this amazing, you know, memory recall, Mm -hmm. but just a kind of an anecdote about how some of the great players do have this amazing memory. And in the book, I mean, as, as you've mentioned there, Dan, it's not to say that you have to have this kind of memory for um, your sport uh, and what, what's happened in the past and games from the past. Um, it, it's interesting to hypothesize how much it, it can help, but you do differentiate in the book between uh, domain-specific uh, cognitive uh, uh, abilities and domain general cognitive abilities. Could you take us through the difference there? Yeah, definitely. Um, one, one of the studies we mentioned in the book regarding uh, the difference between the domain general and the domain specific, as we talk about, is really that difference between you know popular culture, hardware versus software. And so when we talk about cognitions, uh, a lot of that is what what you're born with, the trait of the hardware, uh, your working memory capacity, your information processing speed. But then the software is what during life and during sports training, other types of training, you layer on to that. So you're born with your hardware, but the software can be uh, layered onto that to help you do certain things. Um, one of the studies we quoted in the book uh, was from 2019 and uh, from the German Sport University. And they wanted to see if indeed um, a higher domain general skill, in other words, uh, native uh, working memory, cognition, et cetera, really contributed to better sports skills. Mm. And they uh, gathered 19 studies, so a meta study, comparing the domain general cognitive functions of elite versus non-elite athletes in executive function, visual perception, and and other functions. And their conclusion was, and I'm quoting here, we found that high performance level athletes do have superior cognitive functions compared with low performance level athletes. Additionally, this knowledge could be used by coaches and scientists to test athletes not only physically, but also on the cognitive domain and therefore further individualized training programs to enhance uh, important cognitive functions and reduce those weaknesses that they may have to guarantee uh, their development. And so what they're saying is, I don't know if you can necessarily, and this is something we talked about in the first book, Glenn and I feel like the, the jury's still out of whether you can actually train those domain general abilities, but certainly you can train your specific sport uh, activities for that. And, and Len and Dan, I'd like to hear your uh, your perspective on that. We'll let you go first, Dan, and then I'll pop in. 
So, yes, I mean, I can't contribute any more in terms of whether they're they're trainable. What I I wonder, and we can bring in the work of Dr. Scott Goldman here, um, who assesses these kind of cognitive abilities through his assessment, through his inventory, the athletic quotient inventory. And, um, you know, speaking with him, um, it, it, it feels like that, maybe assessing these abilities is a useful thing to do because then we can compare and contrast what's going on on the pitch or the field um, with relation to what the assessment is telling us. For example, I think one of the things he measures is learning capacity. And I, and I know that's not actually in your book, but for instance, if somebody is struggling to learn plays and the assessment demonstrates that that person finds it more difficult to, to to learn to process information then we can we can allow for that you know we can we can find different ways to help that person to, to to learn and i think the same must be true for attention and working memory and and information processing uh whether one selects based on that obviously you know that goes on in the combine so um that that does actually happen so i wonder if it's if it's a case of the as you're saying dan the jury's out as to to whether we can improve those uh general cognitive abilities but we can certainly say okay let's assess let's see what's going on on the pitch and let's start great conversations here in our coaching staff and maybe with the athlete him or herself um to allow for that because they might have so many great attributes that means hey we've got to work with this athlete to help them be the best that they can be and allow for perhaps slightly um lower cognitive abilities for sure yeah absolutely and and one of the things we uh, uh are you familiar with uh, dr jan meyer at hoffenheim yep absolutely yeah and and we have a section in the in this chapter about his work at Hoffenheim, and I, I, we both found it fascinating because he's in his the academy there. He's on the front lines of actually trying to measure this, and I think he has the same opinion of. I don't know if we can train that general uh, cognitive skill, but we can definitely assess it, as you said, Dan, and we can understand the player better and how we can individualize their training. I have a quote here from Dr. Meyer. Um, who is a, just for reference, he's managing director of the TSG Research Lab there, uh, lead sports psychologist at, uh, at Hoffenheim of the Bundesliga. And so his quote is, youth development must therefore follow one clear objective. Players need to learn to think very fast, consciously. On the pitch, they basically need to be on autopilot, like we are when we're driving a car. Not deliberately thinking whether we're switching from second into third gear or how to operate the clutch, but pure instinct in itself is also no longer enough as there's a match plan to implement. We want to speed up the processes in the brain. Many athletes are too slow in that regard, but you can train and improve them. And he actually, as you know, may know, Dan, he develops um, a score, an actual metric, uh, which he calls the EXF score for executive function, capital E, small X, capital F. And he talks about, uh, he says, another quote from Dr. Meyer, we're seeing a lot of innovations now. They're tracking devices, showing how fast and how far a player is running. We can analyze how many tackles, how many passes a player makes. But all of this data cannot explain successful soccer because it is missing information about what is going on inside the player. There can be a physical reason a player is not sprinting so quickly or running as far but there can also be a cognitive reason. Maybe he did not perceive the run quickly enough. Maybe he was too slow to process the information to track the run. Or as we said earlier, maybe he wasn't paying attention to the right things. And so that's what they're trying to do with their, their training and their analytics there is actually give every player an EXF score and so that they understand it. And the player may have wonderful skills technically, physically, et cetera, but they, if they need some work on their executive functioning score, they can target some training towards that. Dan, uh, if I could add in, chime in. Uh, it's so encouraging to me to hear such good work being done in the applied area on, on this whole cognitive domain. And uh, what Dan just quoted was very well said. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Dr. Eugene Aidman in Australia, who 
has published a paper called Cognitive Fitness Framework Towards Assessing Training and Augmenting Individual Difference Factors Underlying High Performance Cognition. It was published in Frontiers on Human Neuroscience back in January. Are you familiar with that at all, uh, Dan? Uh, primarily through your, your <laughs> book, actually. <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed that part of the of this section. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wanted to add, give a plug to Eugene because you know I just wanted to comment on what Dan was just saying too, and kind of the advances that are taking place right now. And I've known Eugene for gosh twenty five years now when he was still living in, in Moscow, but is now working for the Australian uh, military. Mm. And uh, really a sharp person. And he wanted to develop kind of an analog of physical fitness. That he's calling it cognitive fitness. And uh, so I was participating in a study this past year with him to kind of sharpen what he published in that article. And now there's an, a, an international network of Cognitive neuroscientists and military people uh, trying to uh, to to expand this this notion of cognitive fitness, and hopefully it'll advance what we know, as, as he says in the article, how to better assess it how, and how to train it. Uh, and so he, he he's got military people in, and he's got uh, law enforcement people, uh, uh, and of course uh, athletes and coaches. And so we're doing a Delphi methodology right now to kind of fine tune and come up with the, the main components of uh, what he's calling cognitive fitness. So I'm predicting that in the next half dozen years or so, we'll know a heck of a lot more uh, in this field. So I, I'm encouraged. It, it, it makes me think of the difference between in our profession between cynicism and skepticism. I, I think, and, and I'm, I'm sure you'll back me up here, Len, that that we have to approach every subject with a, a healthy air of skepticism. We can't just accept everything. But if we become cynical, then we don't help our field progress. Exactly. And, uh, and, and I know that, you know, the work of Dr. Jan Meyer at Hoffenheim will be receiving, or has received some, you know, criticism in terms of the efficacy. Um, however, you know, as a practitioner at the ground level, working very heavily in football soccer mm -hmm. um I, I i can i've not been there but i, I can envision and think about the, the the work that they're doing um around their cognitive assessments just i'm going to come back to again great conversations between coaches and between coaches and players that's number one at least we have an assessment we have something that says okay we don't fully know how accurate it is or, or what it actually means on the pitch a hundred percent but it does mean something and we can have better conversations yeah. and we can have better conversations around the, the practices that we create in our activities in our sessions that can make a small difference and if i remember reading this from dr jan meyer in your book um it's that that this, if this just makes a small difference, then, you know, in the world he lives in, it can help a young player potentially have a career in the game. It could potentially help a player who just, who goes from having a career to having a stellar career. That's the difference that this makes. So I think it's, there's the debate around investment and resources and that kind of stuff, but certainly at the very adult elite level, at the very top level of that, where resources are in place, I, I think it's I think it's fascinating, and I think we need to invest in this area. Yeah, you're so right. It's, it's just that less than one percent, but it's huge <laughs> at the high performance level. I'm I, I'm conscious that, um, and I thought this might happen because it's so fascinating, and the book's so fascinating um, that that um, we'd be talking about the first few first few pages. Um, uh, in the first 45 minutes. So I, I want to crack on and, and look, I mean, emotion. I mean, we can probably sum this up in a few minutes that um, you talk about attention control theory from Michael Isenk, who's based um, out, I think, at, uh, at uh, University of London, Royal Holloway. Mark Wilson, who's, I, I believe, based down in Exeter, mm -hmm. um, down on the south coast of England. And um, the great work they've done around attention control theory for sports, ACTS. You talk about, hey, stoic 
stoicism and the, the wealth of books that are coming out uh, largely from Ryan Holiday um, and um, pressure training for building resilience. So some great information for coaches um, in this chapter. I don't know if either of you uh, have something to say about this chapter for a couple of minutes, but very much for me, what came through is learn how to manage your emotions. We as coaches have to be better at helping players uh, manage their emotions to be able to to uh, take control of their cognitive abilities, their attention, and so on. Yeah, and I think that um, as you met, we were excited <laughs> to um, look at attentional control theory. I mean, it it was developed, uh, you know, as a foundational uh, emotional behavior theory, but then they, as you said, these two applied it to mm. sports. And really just broke it down into two th- mm. two systems of attention. It's back to attention again. But uh, emotionally, what you pay attention to, the a goal direction attention, focusing on top-down objectives like win the game, score a goal, get a shutout, uh, and then stimulus or bottom-up sensory information, as, as we say, the shiny object uh, or the distraction during a game uh, that takes you away from your attention on your, on your top-level goals. And that's what um, you know, looking at watching my sons for years play all different kinds of sports, that was the when we tried to come up with the this decision making model and the traits of obvious ones like attention and cognition, meaning what your brain can do, but emotions. I mean, <laughs> I have a quote from um, Phil Knight at the at the beginning of the chapter, um, <laughs> and Phil Knight says. Uh, from Nike, sports is like rock and roll. Both are dominant cultural forces, both speak an international language, and both are all about emotions. And that's pretty much what it is. So it's um, in the emotion of a game has a direct effect on the decisions you make. And that's something that ACTS uh, uh, has a big effect on in, in trying to understand how we think about those emotions. And even if there was a part in there we put about um, you know, players who are aggressive and the number of fouls they commit during a game. And is the aggressive player a better player? Is their performance better because they have this aggressive nature to them, meaning that they're maybe more into the game? So some interesting results come from that as well. Dan, I'd like to add a bit here too on this notion of emotions and how important that is. And uh, being a you know a golf psychologist like you, I suspect that you watched uh, the U.S. Open a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that, that final round with with Matt Wolf and 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 DeChambeau. Yep, uh, and I, and I, you know, I'm I'm kind of a fan of DeChambeau because he's kind of a mad scientist, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I was I said I'm going to just pay attention to this and just kind of see because I had just finished reading uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, Sari Evans' book Performing Under Pressure. Of I am. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and he simplified the whole notion of the importance of emotion, called it kind of the, the red-blue model yep. uh, for performing under pressure. I thought it was brilliant because he kept it so darn simple. Uh, but and I thought I, was, I wrote a little blog on that, that kind of the plug-in, uh, what he talks about into Wolf and DeChambeau. And because in, 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 in our first book, we talked quite a bit about clutch performance and and uh, choking under under pressure, and and certainly you can't say that uh, because Matt Wolf lost that he choked. It's just that the shampoo seemed to handle the pressure much better. But it it, it says so much about uh, how important that is to in a on a really tough golf course to come through with clutch shot after clutch shot and and persevere. So uh, I suspect you you paid a little bit of attention to that as well. Well, absolutely, and it's a great example. And 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 you'd know better than me that rule number one is of of sports psychology is 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 never assume uh, somebody's mindset or somebody's motivation. But let let's have some let's play about with this. I mean, we use this term attention. I just wonder if Matt Wolf's attention, as, as a hypothesis, as a guess, with the greatest of respect to him, because of DeChambeau's, um, you know, the work he did on his physicality, yeah. because he's now hitting it further on tour than than anybody has ever done before. I mean, he's hitting the 400-yard barrier almost on the fly. Um, 
what that does, having been a player yourself, is it forces you, when we come back to distraction and attention, it forces you to focus on the Shambo and say, and you're looking ahead to the holes and you're thinking about the holes he can get almost up to the green on, you know, the par fours. And um, you just wonder if part of that redhead, if we're using Sari Evans's work, was because Matt Wolf is focusing on DeChambeau rather than bringing it back to himself, which is, 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 is you know, so important in golf, is, is, is focus on me, yeah. focus on what I'm doing, um, staying in the present moment and all that jazz. And, and yeah, that, that, that attention um, bears a relationship to emotion, doesn't it? So I think that example then, Len, Len is perfect. Yeah, that was a great analysis. I, I think you hit it spot on there. Now, part two, um, moving forward, uh, constraints. We've talked about the internal, um, and now this is the external, knowing the boundaries, time, rules, tactics, um, time influencing decision-making. You talk about the OODA loop, Dan, observe, orient, decide, act. You lean, uh, as you did in your first book, on Gary, Dr. Gary Klein's work, recognition primed, Decision making and three variations of decision making that perhaps we can talk about. Um, yeah, and actually, you you litter this with a great example from uh, Luca Modric, who plays for Real Madrid. I really enjoyed this, uh, Dan and Len. A few thoughts from you, Dan. Sure, and um, as you mentioned in our, our first book, Playmakers Advantage, uh, we had one chapter on decision making, <laughs> and uh, we briefly covered um, uh, Gary Klein's work. Um, we actually, uh, interviewed Gary shortly after that book came out. Um, mm. we had, weren't able to talk to him before that. Um, but it was a fascinating discussion that we had and, um, that's kind of been his whole, um, you know, research career has yeah. been decisions under pressure. So, yeah. you know, as he talks about, uh, and we were talking about, uh, Modric and, and the 2018 World Cup. And he really talked about that. He was using what he would call his his recognition prime decision-making uh, model. And uh, I put a quote in here from uh, uh, when we were talking to Gary. Uh, he said, I didn't see anybody comparable to him, uh, even on France's team. Modric, he was the guy who was orchestrating it all. He was the playmaker. He was an exemplar in his team. Uh, so definitely the uh, recognition prime decision process was being used there. It's about how can people make decisions, rapid decisions under uncertainty, because you're dealing with an adversary who is trying to be deceptive as well. How can a team make those kinds of decisions without looking at all the options because there's not time to do it? And that's one of the biggest things when we were thinking about, we, we shifted from traits, uh, what's inside a player, to mm-hmm. what are the challenges that they have out on the field. Uh, We talk about, you know, obviously, if you are choosing a new job, you're buying a new car, etc. That's making a decision as well. But you have plenty of time to gather all the research, look at all the list, all of the options, uh, hem and haw and, and understand what decision you're making. But obviously, in the sports world, it's milliseconds, it's subseconds of having to make a decision quickly and hopefully a good decision. And Dr. Klein, uh, for 40 years, uh, not so much in sports, but he's studied other decision makers in time-constrained activities like firefighting, like the military, like police work. And what he comes back with is none of these decision makers have the time. uh, They don't go through a process of listing options. Should I pass here, there, somewhere else? They actually... um, they actually go through a different process of choosing the best option and then going from there and saying, if this one works, and we call, he uses a word called satisfice, um, it suffices and it satisfies this uh, situation, then they go with it. And that's their usually their first option based on years of experience. And that's kind of the thing with training is that's what they want to uh, stress is give young players opportunities to develop these patterns, this library, this inventory of situations that they've seen before 
so that they can pull those up uh, when the time comes. In fact, uh, quoting Dr. Klein here uh, during our interview, he said, I think it's too bad when the training in youth sports is about not making mistakes. It is very procedural. It's getting these drills down. Part of the assumption is once you get all the basics down at some point later in your career, you can learn about the decision-making part. But now you have all kinds of negative transfer to overcome that you have to uh, overcome the way you've been taught to do it. And that's why they, uh, uh, he says the decision-making should be from the very start. That's the way of building adaptive models rather than trying to graft it on later. Kids become paralyzed because they are afraid of making mistakes. You see the tension. You see how nervous they are uh, that they'll be blamed if they don't execute the way that they were taught. And so, uh, yeah, his whole thesis has been on time-constrained decisions. And then, as you said, we also talk about um, – John Boyd. <laughs> I didn't know about John Boyd before uh, I did. We did some research here, and his OODA loop. No, I, I really enjoyed learning about the OODA loop. Obviously, I've 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 read about it before um, to observe, to orient, to decide, um, and and to act. And you you know you to be fair, you both question what is this what athletes are doing, and, and I think really when you read um, the way you break this down in the book, I think they do. They're just doing it so quick and they're just doing it based on, hey, what exactly what a couple of weeks ago, Lisa Feldman Barrett talked about, you know, the neuroscience is backing this up, these chunks of memory and memory is constructed in that moment. It's not necessarily retrieved. It's constructed in that moment. It, it, it's both working on, on experience and online on what's happening in that moment. Players are assessing stunningly quickly, like in milliseconds, and acting on what they see based on what they've seen in the past. But they're also able to um, generate, as she called it, generativity, generate new ideas in that moment. So it, it beautifully goes hand in hand with what Lisa was saying. And you must have then, having practiced this, having consulted for the last uh, 40, 50 years, you must have seen incredible decision-making in the moment, utilizing this notion of OODA loop. Oh, for sure. Uh, but as I said at the outset, I I just didn't uh, put it all together, uh, realizing mm. what a skill that is, and, and uh, we're not talking enough about it, uh, particularly with coaches. But I know since the book came out and mean before that, in all my conversations with coaches, they really latch on to this concept. And it's kind of, can you tell me more? Uh, more importantly, can we measure this? Can we teach it? But more importantly, how can I better structure the drills that we're going to be doing on the pitch to integrate more of the cognition and emotional regulation? So it's, it's, it, they, they all buy into it. It's just that you, you think of this uh, era of coaches, they were never taught that in their coach education training programs and when if they were players their coaches didn't talk much about that this whole notion of decision making and how we can facilitate that so uh, the point as we said all along here in, in this hour that the good news is that that the world of sport is, is gravitating towards this notion and we're, we're we're kind of pleased that we're making a small but perhaps significant contribution well, Len, you mentioned teaching, you know, teaching decision making and, and um, it, that becomes easier, not easy, but easier when you've got frameworks. And so OODA loop offers a framework yes, for teaching. Exactly. Gary Klein's recognize, recognition prime decision uh, making offers a framework that, that helps us as coaches to think about how we're going to teach these things moving on to rules uh, i mean actually dan you mentioned earlier about um, uh, instrumental aggression and you talk more about this in 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 this uh, chapter you talk about why players make decisions that violate rules you talk about the complexity of rules and how that influences decision making rules changing you know clearly makes a difference to say you know, how a quarterback operates. Um, they might have spent years operating in a particular manner, a rule change, and suddenly their brain has to work completely differently in that moment. So I think that's, I think that's uh, a fascinating notion. But on this uh, aggression, hostile versus instrumental aggression, I mean, I, I found this part interesting. And I'd like to ask both of you what, what you think of this here, because I... Having watched The Last Dance on Netflix, Michael Jordan, for me, I see somebody... Now, in your book, 
instrumental aggression is defined a little bit differently because it's it's if I may say it's defined as hurting a player in order to gain advantage in the game to win. Whereas hostile aggression is defined more as I'm just going to go and hurt a player. But I think this is really interesting. I, I mean, I have a, a, a an ongoing interest in personality science, and um, I actually quite like the work of Colin de Jong, based out in Minnesota. And um, he talks about he's actually trying to uncover the neurological underpinnings of the five main traits that we talk about in the Big Five. And Big five. yeah, and and he talks about instrumental aggression as part of low agreeableness. Um, and hostility is part of neuroticism, um, so a negative emotion. But that low agreeableness, that aggression, it, it feels like when I watch that documentary and I see Michael Jordan looking, he makes a decision that he's going to trash talk. Then you talked earlier about trash talking. I'm going to trash talk a player yeah. to get myself up for this, to actually inject emotion in. But actually, this emotion is related to possibly related to aggression. And that to me is real instrumental aggression. I am instrumentally trying to make myself more emotional, make myself more aggressive. And he utilizes that emotion to potentially overpower the opposition. Um, so it was just really absolutely no questions, guys. But I, I found it interesting that you talked about host, hostile versus instrumental aggression, albeit in a slightly different way, but how that impacts decision making. And how it, it, it ties to, there was one study we talked about in there, um, it ties to personalities and assessments and this hec- mm. this hexaco uh, scale, um, yep. honesty, humility, emotionality, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience. And so one study, they looked at 242 uh, top under-19 German basketball players, and they actually tracked a season of their fouls with the individual results that each of the players had taken on this test. And they tried to see a correlation between number of fouls and and the personality uh, spectrum that each player was under. And the only trait that had a statistically significant correlation with fouls was conscientiousness. And that's described by the contrast between the adjectives organized, careful, precise versus sloppy, reckless, and ir- irresponsible. Those high in conscientiousness committed fewer fouls of all types than those low in this trait. And not even honesty, humility, uh, which would be, you know, kind of a, an obvious trait for someone who's, you know, a little more uh, timid on the court. That was not linked to the number of fouls. So it's interesting that, and then there was other studies of, you know, the more aggressive players. Yes, they... Um, uh, play better after they've committed some fouls. We had an example from the NBA uh, playoffs last year and the series that it was all kinds of different fouls uh, throughout the series, rough fouls, technical fouls, people getting thrown out. But then how some of those players played even better once they got that, that emotional uh, construct up that they they were really into the game and they were committing fouls and then they performed better. On the other hand, another study said uh, all of those technical fouls do not overall help a team win, that it actually hurts the team. So uh, it's some interesting, we looked at it at the beginning of a player on the court, on the field, one of those constraints is the rule book. And like you said, Dan, especially if the rules change over time, we talked about uh, Clay Matthews, formerly of the Green Bay Packers, now with the Rams. Um, and he played most of the first half of his professional career with certain rules about roughing the quarterback and that penalty that's called what you can and can't do when you're tackling the quarterback. Then the rules changed. <laughs> and and now there were much more strict rules about how you can tackle the quarterback and how he struggled with that because his brain was wired to a certain set of rules to say, I can do this to the quarterback. I can't do this to the quarterback. And now someone pulled the rug out from under him and said, okay, here's the new rules. And in that instant second where he's rushing the quarterback and the quarterback's moving and he's moving, now he has to relearn that rule 
and readjust how he's going to hit the quarterback and make a split second decision. And, and that's difficult to do. Interesting. Interesting. Um, tactics, final chapter in, uh, in the second part of the book. Research suggests that experience makes a difference when it comes to the capacity to pay attention to tactics, to execute tactics, to make the right tactical decisions. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the relationship between tactics and decision making. Again, as the uh, as a constraint, um, you know, there's this, and you know, this Dan uh, working with so many football teams. There's this balance, this fine line between tactics, strategy, and creativity uh, on the field. And, mm. you know, that for a developing athlete, you know, one of the things they don't want to have happen is being yelled at by the coach. And so the coach um, uh, sets out the tactics, not only overall, this is how we play, this is our formation, this is how we move the ball up and down the field, and that's what they learn in training. Um, but also for a specific opponent, you know, game plan against this opponent. These are our tactics. This is how you should play, et cetera. So all that is learned in training during the week. And now, especially for a developing player, they have to go out in the field and amongst everything else going on, time constraints, rule constraints, emotions, et cetera, they have to remember, oh, that's right. I'm supposed to do this this week against this opponent. I have to remember what I learned and apply that that tactical overlay onto what I'm doing out here, or <laughs> I'm going to get yelled at by the coach. Um, and so that's um, that's the question of how does a coach put in tactics? How do they train tactics so that the player uh, isn't overwhelmed by everything they have to learn? Um, we talked about a an assistant coach at Borussia uh, Mönchengladbach. Rene Merrick, I believe is how you say his name. Um, are you familiar with him, Dan? Um, he follows me on Twitter. There so, you go. Yes, I, yes, <laughs> yes. He listens to my ramble. So, uh... and that that really describes him from what I learned of him is he is a sponge. He he is he is a student of the game in all senses, and <clears throat> so he's had quite a, a meteoric rise in the coaching world. Um, tell the story about how he was. Uh, playing some soccer and coaching just a, a youth team in a small town in Austria. And then he started writing articles about tactics, football tactics. And uh, through the magic of the internet, he would post these articles and they got more and more reads uh, to the point where he'd post an article and thousands of people would be reading it. And he would have coaches from professional teams uh, sending him messages saying, hey, I have a question about this. And so all of a sudden, um, and, and this is, comes from uh, intensive studying that he did and trying to learn the game and trying to learn uh, new ways of, of explaining tactics. And one thing led to another. Um, he got into the Red Bull organization. I think he was at Salzburg uh, with uh, their manager, Rose. Uh, they won the league. They moved up to, uh, I think it was last year, the first year at Mönchengladbach, and they're doing well. And so uh, he's had some interesting comments about how they train tactics. And I'll just, I'll just read one of his quotes here. Uh, this is uh, Rene Merrick. For me, it's definitely not a specific match plan with predetermined sequences, situations, or moves. In my mind, tactics describe the sum of a team's decisions about how they're going to solve a particular situation. Tactics is, for instance, a player recognizing where and how he is being closed down, but still managing to see an available teammate, and also how that teammate has positioned himself in such a way to remain available, and then to receive a pass in the right place at the right moment. Ultimately, it's a very simple process. On the pitch, you're either protecting the ball, demanding the ball, or creating space. There is nothing else. Tactics is the mutual resolving of a situation through these actions by means of predefined playing philosophies which correspond with the player's abilities and their understanding of the game. So his point is, it's not maybe specific tactics, but it's philosophies of how we play the game that should be coached. It feels like what he's saying bears a great relationship with 
uh, the conversation I had with coach developer from the English FA, Amy Price, on the Sports Psych Show. We spoke about metacognition, so thinking about your thinking, uh, uh, revolving around strategy, strategic decision making. Uh, so not just tactical decision making, but actually your own personal strategic decision making in the moment under pressure. Uh, the the capacity to to deal with uh, a, a a game that's where the the situation the landscape is changing moment to moment, um, so that really resonated with me in the book. And you also talk about the great work of Daniel Mehmet, um, his uh, work on creativity, and I know he's written a book on on creativity and the six D's deliberate play one dimension games diversification deliberate coaching deliberate motivation deliberate practice so real rich detail mm. in this um, chapter then on tactics and and decision making yeah that's uh, so important and uh, uh, I wanted to make a point also too is that all the hours that coaches spend looking at video and giving instructional feedback to, to their athletes at video and have the athletes look at video. And, and I think it's there's got to be a more efficient use of video, particularly in using it to ask, kind of occlude the video. You know, we're using a lot of that in baseball now. Uh, uh, mm. Abernathy's work on, on visual occlusion, temporal visual occlusion. You just occlude the video and say, what should be done now? But you see, that takes time. Coaches are always pressed for time. It's easier to tell somebody what to do than it is to ask them what they should have done given what they just saw. And so, you know, it's part of the, you know, evolution, I hope, in coaching strategies where we we're, we'll train coaches to, to ask better questions of their athletes, why they did uh, execute in a certain way, or what perhaps should they have done. They've never thought enough about that. So it's, you say, thinking about thinking is what we should be doing. Well, guys, I think it's a, it's, it's a measure of how good this book is. Um, we're over an hour and a quarter into the, uh, into this conversation and we haven't uh, gone into part three yet. And I did say at the beginning that we'll probably just touch upon part three, because I knew the conversation was going to be really rich from these first two parts. Um, and I know the audience, um, will be heavily motivated to um, go out and, and purchase the book and dive into it from just the conversation we've had. But I suppose, Dan, in a nutshell, you know, part three is entitled The Pursuit of the Perfect Decision. Uh, why don't you uh, spend a couple of minutes just um, telling us a little bit about what we can find in part three, The Pursuit of the Perfect Decision? Yeah, and it's, so we, as I said, we divided it into two into two parts um measurement and then improvement and we thought well we'll just we'll just write a section now on, on improving decisions and like most things uh we need to measure um how we're making decisions and len and i just spent a lot of time trying to come up trying to find if there's any you know systems out there of how coaches are actually measuring decision making you know they'll measure a 40 hour dash time they'll measure passes completed and all of those things, but what actually defines decision-making quality and how can we set a baseline and then watch it improve or change over time? And there wasn't an easy answer. Um, you know, the coaches we talked to, they're like, eh, I can kind of see it, or I can look at the basic stats and see if, and I'll just say that's better decision-making, but obviously there's so many variables out there to, to track. So in the chapter on metrics, on measuring decisions, we just uh, told some stories about, in a few different sports, um, how they're using some of these advanced uh, metrics to look at and analytics to look at the topic of decision making. We give the example, obviously, we talked earlier about Dr. Jan Meyer at Hoffenheim, and he's come up with this statistic of EXF for executive function, and that's directly in, in his world, directly correlated to that aspect of decision making. <clears throat> we talk about baseball, and obviously, baseball is ripe with analytics and stats. Uh, but their high technology of first they used the pitch FX system, then they went to TrackMan. But basically, that flood of data gives them um, 
uh, a lot of information about uh, a topic that a lot of coaches talk about, plate discipline. And that's something that Len has concentrated a lot at, at Game Sense Sports. And he was talking about uh, the occlusion of training, pitch recognition, et cetera. But these are stats to measure that. So what they're talking about is, you know, stats like how many times did you swing at a pitch outside the strike zone? How many times did you swing at a pitch inside the strike zone? How many times did you make contact outside the strike zone, inside the strike zone? And and that feeds other stats like based on the pitches you were seeing and where they were, what would be your expected batting average and expected slugging percentage, on-base percentage, et cetera. And so they're really trying to break down all of those batting stats to plate discipline. In other words, are you making the right decision swinging at the right pitches? Try not to swing at pitches that are outside the strike zone. Try to swing at ones that are inside the strike zone. And trying to you know, understand that and track a player's hitting ability uh, going forward with that. Um, we also used a story um, that we had heard about a little bit right after the first book came out. Um, some researchers, some AI researchers of all people, a uh, uh, gentleman named Dr. Patrick Lucy, who was first at Disney Research when he started all of this, and now he's at Stats, the sports information company. And he has some fascinating, not only research, but but products that he's developed for Stats. Uh, for example, in the NBA, uh, they use the they have been using the the Sports View cameras, where they put all the cameras in all of the arenas, and then that gives all these analysts just mountains of data. And what they do is they actually track individual players and the ball as they move around the court during a game. And then from that, you know, the the uh, stats and analytics folks can go nuts as far as how fast they're moving, where they're moving, you know, the decision-making, et cetera. And now he's actually gotten to a point where he said, that's great, but now I can see where the X's and O's are moving around on the field. And he's built simulations to show teams, this is what you did on this play. But if we fed thousands and thousands and thousands of plays into the artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence mirroring a championship defensive team, here's how that team would have played that specific play. And they can show what they they call them ghost images. And they they have these uh, virtual players on the screen and they're they're actually playing the defense a little bit differently. So it's actually showing uh, how well you played defense in that play, but here's how the optimal way to play defense in that play would look. Um, and obviously that's all very high tech, very expensive, not accessible to to developing athletes. But it just shows that, for example, in the baseball example, even looking at stats like uh, walks divided by strikeouts will give you an example of a plate discipline and how well you're making decisions. Um, Len, did you want to touch on that as far as the work with Game Sense and how they're measuring decision making? Well, it's you know, baseball is just a unique sport in the sense that you're trying to make a, a decision in about two or three hundred millis- milliseconds. You know that's so unique. You know, cricket would be very cricket would be very much the same. And so we're working with the Australians on on that and developing the software. And, and it also applies to serve recognition in tennis when you get these 140, 150 mile an hour serves. We have to make quick decisions. And how do you do that? How do we train that? So that's what uh, uh, Game Sense is working on right now, trying to develop uh, uh, technology that can uh, help athletes uh, uh, improve their rapid decision making. And it all it's going you know we've got the software it's a it's a it's an app it goes onto your tablet or onto your iPhone and during this COVID time it's a it's a wonderful way to train you can get at bats without being in a batting cage or at the ball field you could be at home um, it's 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 getting at bats getting those deliberate practice uh, notions um, enacted so we're working diligently on that uh, so. There's um, there's an applied end to some of my madness as well, Dan. <laughs> oh, no, no madness. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And um, look, so much rich detail there. So many, so many um, 
so much information in, in part three. I, I'm just sorry we don't necessarily have time to, to cover it in more detail. But guys, thank you so much for this book. Really have enjoyed going through it. Uh, before before we close, um, I suppose my final question is, uh, are we going to have a trilogy? What's next? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Len and I still have to talk about that. One of the things <clears throat> when we, when, after the first one came out and there was some interest, um, we, we said, well, what are some other things we want to cover? Um, we have talked about in general, and the Playmaker's Advantage is is obviously still out there and available if people want to start with the, the basics and, and the core of what we did. And then now the Playmaker's Decisions uh, is what just came out. And I don't know, Len and I have talked about you know, one of the people we've left out of this is the coach. And uh, should we have a, a third volume called The Playmaker's Coach, which has a lot of uh, interesting angles. There's a lot of coaching science out there. But I don't know. What do you think, Len? Are you up for another one? Well, I, gotta, I need a little break here, Dan. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention one more thing. You know, we, we, we thought we, 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 Dan and I thought so much about kind of how could we give specific guidelines on improving decision-making, and that was a tough nut to crack. But towards the end of the book, around 258, and this was borrowed directly from the, uh, the UK coaching guidelines, where there are eight recommendations for building stronger decision-makers uh, in, 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 in sports. And uh, I'm not going to read them to you. Your readers can go right to that part of the book, but they've probably heard of it, many of them before. Very simple suggestions, and I think Starting there would be go, go a long way to improving decision making in our uh, aspiring athletes. Well, well said, Len, because I I know the the, the guys and the girls at uh, UK Coaching, and they really are. I'm biased because I'm English, but UK Coaching <laughs> they're some they're some of the best in the business. They really are for so sure, for sure. They're fantastic. So. Um, Thank you so much to to both of you uh, for your time. Um, it's it's a great read. It's an essential read. Um, it almost feels like it makes a great trilogy with the the two books from the last two weeks um, as well. So that's really exciting for me to help people make sense of of the cognitive side, the newer scientific side that underpins. Uh, participation, progression, and performance in sports. Um, where can people get hold of this this book? The usual channels, and and where can people find uh, you both uh, to learn more about the work, the great work that you're both doing? Sure. So the uh, the playmakers' decisions available now. It's on all of the online platforms. It's a uh, Kindle and paperback on Amazon. It's also on Apple, Google, Barnes and Noble. Also has a print version. Um, Kobo. And that's, um, you know, for all the international sites as well. I know it's on Amazon UK, et cetera. And then um, as far, and then also obviously the Playmaker's Advantage from two years ago is also available and out there. So if they want to uh, get both of them. Um, and I am on Twitter at uh, Daniel Peterson. And we also have a website, uh, 80% Mental 80 percentmental.com uh, and there's more information there um, and yeah we would love to hear any questions or you know talk to me on Twitter and I'd be happy to respond I can get uh, I haven't gotten Len on Twitter yet but uh, I can certainly forward him a question yeah I'm not very active on Twitter uh, <laughs> I'm there but uh, you catch me on LinkedIn and, and certainly uh, I'm heavily involved with the Game Sense program. So you can just find uh, find me on uh, uh, gamesensports.com. Uh, but also you reach me through uh, Dan's website as well. We're, we're on there. Perfect. Gents, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's been great. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed that podcast. And I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Psych Show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.